Welcome to the Inconvenient Minority Podcast. I'm your host, Kenny Shu. Joining me today is author, political commentator, uh, Heather McDonald. Heather has written two best-selling books. One is The War on Cops, uh, where she discusses the narrative of systemic police racism um, and its falsities. And then two is The Diversity Delusion, How Race and Gender Pandering Undermine a University. Uh, Heather, it's, it's great having you here. Well, thank you so much for having me on, Kenny. I greatly appreciate it. Yeah, no, absolutely. You too. So you grew up, uh, you're the, the daughter of an attorney, um, and then you attended Stanford uh, Law School. And so you kind of started off on the attorney track. So what made you decide that, hey, I decide I want to start writing uh, and, and be a writer? Well, actually, I went to law school not out of any interest in becoming a attorney. I had yet to completely purge myself of my interest in critical theory, alas, which had uh, destroyed much of the benefit that I should have gotten from college uh, because I, I was stupid, uh, too stupid to realize that deconstruction was a completely phony uh, explanation of how language works. And instead I was a devoted acolyte after college. I uh, studied linguistics in England at Cambridge university and became, I start, that was the start of my separation, my intellectual separation from the literary theory that I had absorbed uncritically in college, but I wasn't completely ready to, junk the entire apparatus. And Stanford Law School was one of the two centers in the country uh, at that point doing critical legal studies, uh, which is not critical race theory. In fact, critical race theory was a reaction against critical legal studies. So I went to, to law school thinking that this was a middle ground between an academic discourse that I regarded as increasingly sterile when it came to the study of literature, and yet I still was interested in problems of interpretation, how you read texts, hermeneutics, you know, how do you get access to an author's intention? All of these are still very interesting philosophical issues. And so I thought, well, law struggles with them all the time, constitutional law, you know, how do you read the constitutional text? Do we do we try and get access to the founders' intentions or do we treat it as a freestanding document? So that's why I went to law school. So it's not surprising that I didn't end up practicing law. Wow. So you you started off in college really adhering to the critical studies. Oh, absolutely. And, but again, it was not critical race theory. It had nothing to do with race. That's the interesting thing about the origins of all this. Deconstruction was a Mandarin science. It was immaculately elitist. We read, we read uh, dead white males without anybody thinking to complain but we read them in a very perverse way. But it, it, at the time, it was not particularly political. It was it was philosophical, but uh, I would argue it, uh, ignorant in its in its philosophy, especially when it comes to how language works. You know, I, I read a little bit of Derrida and and a little bit of Deconstruction, although I'm definitely not as expertly versed as you are in it. But I think part of what he says. Is that is that language informs your reality, and, and that you can you can create an entirely subjective reality just by by the language that you use? Do you think that that informs some of this? I guess the semantics why people use words like systemic racism today to kind of describe their overarching reality. Well, that's an interesting point, and and you're absolutely right to to tease that out of Derrida. You know, he famously said. Il n'y a rien de hors le texte. There's nothing outside of the text. And so at its most radical, you had people like Paul DeMond at Yale uh, claiming that the human self was a fiction. I and mean, that was something that was actually pervasive throughout the practitioners, that there was no such thing as the self. It was merely a trope. It was a linguistic trope. You know, you got the background with, with Heidegger that language speaks through us. Uh, but there is something real about the fact that, yes, we do live in language and it does inform our world. There's a, a debate within linguistics about the validity of the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, but that was, uh, you know, linguistic theory that said that 
Eskimos have 20 different words for snow and therefore they perceive snow. They experience snow differently because of the way language structures their reality. Others, other linguists have said that's, that's an exaggeration. There are certain basic, uh, you know, destination points in our world that are preceding the linguistic reality. As far as whether that deconstructive view uh, on the fundamental role of language in constructing the human being is currently governing uh, the the left wing attack, I don't think so. I think they would be. I think they would be trying to. Uh, define things their way to impose a set of ever-changing, excruciatingly precious linguistic distinctions on the public, regardless of what deconstruction said about, about things. Because, you know, that's been the modus operandi of, of revolutionary movements forever, which is to try to control the language. Yeah. And, uh, and the, the slippery nature of their terms is just you, you can talk about systemic racism, but when you ask them what it means, it, it, they always say they say something like it's the almost kind of like it oozes out of society or it just oozes in the atmosphere or racist ad, attitudes just kind of exist in the ether, you know, and um and it allows them to to put kind of unicausality on all of these uh, all of these issues that we face today. When in reality, they're they're so much more complex than that. Yeah, I, that's a frequent conservative critique. I'm not, I'm not sure I buy it completely. I think if you push them, they would have arguments about our institutions uh, being structured to uh, privilege. You know, that's a term that came from. Derrida, you know, the, the privileging conceit uh, the, to certain bourgeois norms that they think are racist, uh, you know, that, that the criminal justice system is structured to create mass incarceration, to recreate uh, Jim Crow. So I, I don't find the definition problematic. What I find is that it ignores, as you suggest, uh, a whole set of other possible out explanations for the fact that we do have racial socioeconomic disparities. What is not allowed to be spoken in mainstream elite discourse is behavior and culture and personal responsibility. None of that is allowed to be acknowledged in the uh, progressive discourse about white supremacy and, and, and dominant uh, you know, ra- systemic racism. Right. And, and it's interesting, though, um, because we do privilege things. People do privilege things. We have a hierarchy of perception. Um, and, and this is why I think race theory can be compelling to people sometimes, because, you know, as an Asian American, I did remember prioritizing other Asian Americans in my life. Um, now, I'm not sure if it was because I inherently perceived or was biased towards people who looked like me, or if it was because my parents just set me up with people who looked like me. Um, but but do, you, do you believe, though, that you can sort of be privileging, you know, certain races just kind of inherently in your life, just as a matter of existence? Well, I think that there's no question that people prefer homogeneity. The idea that human beings deliberately seek out diversity is just wrong. That's just not the case. You know, listen to the discourse about Washington, D.C., the complaints from years ago that it was becoming no longer Chocolate City. You know, there's too many whites moving in there. It's not as if blacks are necessarily desperate to have whites. You can believe if, if there were a lot of whites coming into Africa or Chinese, there would be a, a complaint about that. So, you know, the, uh, the fact of the matter is, is that the more diverse a community, the less social trust there is. So diversity, you know, that's the great finding of Robert Putnam, uh, who studied this and found that there was less uh, 
philanthropy, people were more suspicious of their neighbors in the more diverse American neighborhoods. And that was a, a finding and Putnam is no conservative and he you know, immediately tried to walk it back, but that is what his research had found. So, uh, so whether that then becomes, whether the preference for homogeneity necessarily leads to some kind of oppressive hierarchy uh, in itself, I'm, I don't think so. I think what structures hierarchies in this society today, at least, is achievement and meritocracy, which is to say that the history of America is just unbelievably appalling in the cruelty towards blacks. And I don't think that the conservative narrative about, oh, well, we fought the Civil War and that made it all great. And it was, you know, we've lived by our principles ever since is really adequate to how longstanding the daily petty insults and, and contempt that were meted upon blacks continued until, you know, fairly recently. But now, however, far from having white privilege, the reality of our world is black privilege. We really have changed just as we've changed radically with regards to attitudes towards homosexuality, showing that it is possible for a culture to reverse itself 180 degrees. That is now the case uh, for blacks. So, okay, so defend that because when, um, when, when I, if, if it is true, as you say, that we inherently privilege, that people inherently privilege hom- homogeneity, um, that is just existence. And there has to be some sort of countering structure that is not natural, that is artificial, that America has created throughout history that allows us to actually go from uh, homogeneous privilege to meritocracy, um, and what is that? Well, first of all, again, I don't, I don't agree with your use of the term of privilege in its sense of of something that is oppressive. I, I, I'm just saying that it's the case that people prefer to group with people that they view as similar to themselves. That does not necessarily lead to an oppressive hierarchy, which is usually implied by the term privilege. You may be using it in a much more neutral sense of of simply favoring one group for social interactions or whatever over another, as opposed to exercising a legitimate power. But as, okay, so we do have now a very diverse country and the only way to hold that together is through a set of neutral colorblind principles that are applied regardless of somebody's politics, regardless of their various trendy and superficial identity traits that are now being celebrated ad nauseum, and the belief that you can have justice, that there are neutral tribunals before which you can come if you're, say, accused by the state, and and you will have a neutral fact finder and judge. That is something that is we can no longer assume. It's certainly the case as well with, with big tech's power. So, uh, but, but you do need to have some kind of overarching set of ideas that can encompass particularities. And I would assume that you would say that the U.S. criminal justice system is one such structure that was artificially created. It was created by people, um, but it does help to check against against tribalism, uh, and it checks against uh, the the innate desire to prefer homogeneity. Yes, it should. There should be a neutral standard of law, uh, and now we see it the criminal justice system being unwound because, despite the fact that it is neutral and colorblind, it unequivocally does have a disparate impact on blacks. Uh, but that is not because the system is racist. It's because blacks have a exponentially higher rate of violent crime. In New York City, for example, blacks commit 75% of all drive-by shootings, though they're 23% of the population. If you add Hispanic shootings to black shootings, you account for over 96% of all shootings in New York City. In Chicago, Blacks are about a third of the population. They commit 80% of all shootings. A, a black New Yorker is 
20 times more likely to commit a shooting than a white New Yorker. A black Chicagoan is 50 times more likely to commit a shooting than a white Chicagoan. You cannot enforce the law without having a disparate impact on criminals. And sadly, uh, the blacks are disproportionately represented in the criminal class. Now, you know, when it, the way to talk about this inevitably is to say, but they're also disproportionately represented among victims. And that's true as well. Minorities make up about 96% of the victims of drive-by shootings in New York. So when you, when you dismantle the criminal justice system in the name of avoiding disparate impact on black criminals, what you end up doing is accelerating disparate impact on black victims, which is what we're seeing now with this utterly horrific nationwide acceleration of the most brutal and callous and mindless violent street crime. I think the, the audience and everything like that, we you know, have studied these statistics and studied, studied these in detail. And also I've studied your work um, as well. And I'm grateful for you pointing out what's going on in the country here. Um, some people uh, on the left would make the, the argument in retort that uh, 80% of the traffic stops that policemen take you know, against in, in these cities are against black and Hispanic people. I think that's what Tim Lynch said in Reason in a review of your book, uh, The War on Cops. Um, do you think that's excessive or do you think that's just right? You always have to look at the crime benchmark. You, po population benchmarks are irrelevant. It turns out that the driving in inner city areas is appalling. Uh, there's a whole program within the Department of Transportation that studies what it calls the nexus between crashes and crime. Uh, there's been recent reporting that blacks are disproportionately killed as pedestrians. The reason is because they're in inner city neighborhoods where driving is out of control. This used to be, there used to be a, a, a small window of possibility of studying driving behavior in the early 2000s. And there was a major, major study done on the New Jersey Turnpike and the Garden State Parkway in New Jersey uh, by an outfit that had worked for this New Jersey state in a racial profiling lawsuit against the New Jersey state troopers for uh, disparate rates of stops. And after the consent decree was imposed on the troopers alleging racial profiling, the police union went to the same outfit and said, well, belatedly, I mean, this is what should have happened from the very start. Could you please study driving behavior? And it, 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 it had tens of thousands of data points from photographs taken of drivers, which it then matched up with a, a three panel to try and three person panel to try and uh, determine the race of the drivers and found that blacks sped at twice the rate of whites on the relevant roads. And it speeds over 90 miles an hour. The disparity was much greater. So no, I do not accept disparate rates of car stops as proof of police bias. Yeah. Yeah. And I wouldn't either. And I wouldn't either. I would have to look at the criminal data. Um, and so, you know, this is, this is a, an, an important issue because, you know, I, I've always been, I think, historically interested in tribalism, in hierarchies and how hierarchies are formed. And what we have today in the criminal justice system is, is probably one of the biggest checks checks that we can have against 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 lynching and against the kind of racial tribalism that can occur in our society today because we have due process we have trial by jury we have you know an individual's right to stand court and and bring in an attorney um, for themselves um, so you know this this is something that that I wish people would would know more of in this discourse you're absolutely right. You are absolutely right. We are completely oblivious to how precious this legacy of due process is that was developed over centuries uh, within, the, within the British system, you know, with, I guess, some contributions from European jurisprudence, 
but it is unheard of in many other places. And we are rapidly dismantling it with ideas like belief survivors. That is the antithesis of, of the presumption of innocence. And, and of course, we saw within European systems, you know, before you had the evolution of, of these sorts of checks, the presumption of guilt, you know, torturing people to get them to confess. And if you, you know, if you torture them and they confess, then of course they're guilty, but you, you know that they're guilty to begin with. Now you have law graduates of the most elite law schools like Harvard and Yale uh, during the Kavanaugh hearings protesting and, and, and proclaiming belief survivors, what's terrifying of that about that is that these are the feeder schools disproportionately for the federal bench. So if those graduates of Harvard and Yale and other elite schools that are committed to this feminist narrative that survivors are entitled, so-called you know, uh, sexual assault survivors, alleged sexual assault survivors, are entitled to a presumption of belief uh, that's going to make it absolutely impossible to hold a fair trial for those types of cases. And you better believe that that attitude is going to bleed over into other cases as well. And I would also say that the trial of Derek Chauvin, you know, maybe they, they reached the right conclusion, but the haste with which it was reached and the clear fact that those jurors knew that if they didn't convict not only would Minneapolis burn to the ground, but many other American cities as well. The threat of ra race riots is going to hang over every trial of a police officer from here on out. And that is going to make it very, very difficult to be confident that the result was reached through the objective evaluation of evidence rather than the implicit threat that you've got you know, the fate of American cities on your conscience if, if you don't convict. But then how can you prevent that? How can you prevent the jury, you know, knowing as most juries do now about such consequences? Yeah, that's very hard. You know, in this, in the Chauvin case, there were motions to move the trial outside of Minneapolis. The Minneapolis Star Tribune's coverage had been just relentless and explicit about Chauvin being, of course, guilty whether that would have mattered much if it had gone further out of Hennepin County in, in Minnesota, I don't know, but that's a good question. You know, the, the, it's hard to solve that within the system. What has to change is the overarching narrative that holds that uh, we're living through an epidemic of racially biased police shootings of black men, which is simply not borne out by the actual data. Right. So I'd like to uh, move on to just talk about achievement um, and, and meritocracy. By appearing on this podcast, you, you know, my listeners are already very familiar with all of the arguments knowing about Asian Americans, about black students. You know, we discuss your arguments very frequently. So I'm just going to move on to solutions, <laughs> which is uh, what is the number one thing you could, you would say that local governments can do, particularly local governments with a lot of black and Hispanic minority students, to save failing schools? Hmm. Well, for one thing, focus relentlessly on content, subject matter, academic skills. There is not enough time to compensate for the gaps in, in many uh, students' homes to be futzing around with self-indulgent politics. So as a preliminary matter, uh, well, what we should really do is shut down all the education schools because they are the feeder of the, what I once wrote about calling it the anything but knowledge ethic of, of contemporary pedagogy, which is... What do you mean by education schools? The, the, the schools that... Uh, credentialized teachers to teach. Oh, okay. School. The teachers college. To teach in yeah. a public school, you need to go to, yeah, teachers college at Columbia, Bank Street. Uh, there's education departments throughout the country that are, you know, turning out these students and the programs of ed schools. This was, I wrote my article about teacher ed back in the 1990s and 
I attended classes at Columbia Teachers College and other local schools at, in New York, like Hunter College at school. And they were already, I mean, just massively left-wing. Everybody thinks that ideas like multicultural math are something novel. No, they were promoting that back then. You know, you cannot insist on accuracy. That's a white uh, male uh, norm that is inappropriate for minority students. And, and they were committed, as I say, it was anything but knowledge. So education is about community building, it's about democracy, but it is not about cramming as much hard knowledge into the empty noggins of students as you can in the meager time remaining is. So I would get rid of the ed schools, focus on content, you know, content rich education. Uh, I know that, you know, the conservative solution is always market-based of vouchers and charter schools. Uh, I'm, I don't think it's necessarily a panacea unless, unless we say that, yes, but we are expecting that the content of education is content rich and, and based on knowledge, not on politics. So, uh, and even the charter schools now are going left. I mean, one of the great chains was is called KIPP. That's an acronym for knowledge is power. And I can't remember what the other P is, but they were one of the founders of what was called the No Excuses Movement, which said, we're going to take these poor minority kids in and we are going to script every moment of their day to try and create a sense of bourgeois values of deferred gratification of study and, and teachers uh, were, were also scripted in what they could say in the sense that we have to make up for what are completely chaotic home environments. And, and they had an uplifting motto about, you know, hard work. Well, they've recently just completely said that that's racist. Uh, it doesn't account for systemic racism. So we cannot, expect the bourgeois norms of deferred gratification. So charter schools, some of them are good, but it, it, that is not a panacea either. Yeah. Well, have you ever heard the term, or have you ever heard the phrase, when the rich catch a cold, the poor die of pneumonia? Yeah, I have. And, and that was embodied by a book by a former city journal editor, Myron Magnet, called The Dream and the Nightmare, which was a critique of 1960s ideology, the, you know, drug, sex, and rock and roll, and tune out, and tune in and tune out, whatever, uh, and, and said that the elites could monkey around with their period of, of being bohemian and, and uh, going to the ashram and, and dropping out of school and, and being stoned all the time, but they did have enough social capital to write themselves. But when you had the norms of sobriety, temperance, uh, deferred gratification mocked by the elites, uh, and if those were then absorbed, that, that mockery and, and contempt was absorbed by the lower classes, they don't have the safety cushion. And so they are going to be much more hurt in their development of social capital to, to be able to succeed than than the more prosperous people are. Right. Yeah, I mean, and that, that's what I meant when you brought up the idea of bourgeois values for these children. I mean, in a sense, they do need bourgeois values. You know, when, when, they ha when they come from broken homes, where are they going to be able to learn? Where are they going to be able to learn how to be disciplined in their schoolwork, how to be able to study, how to be able to, you know, make friends and socialize in an environment? Um, and sadly, the schools aren't teaching them that. Right, exactly. I mean, there's just chaos. And, be, when, you know, one of the huge uh, handicaps and just most horrible, terrible, uh, destructive policies that we could have, I mean, everything, everything in our world today, here's the key, thing, it's all driven by disparate impact. We are unwinding every single civilizational legacy uh, and norm because of disparate impact whether it's in criminal justice or academic achievement expectations of, of meritocracy, because any kind of neutral colorblind standard will have disparate impact. 
The worst is, of course, the disparate impact conceit applied to school discipline. Uh, and so you have now schools that are terrified to discipline their kids because under the Obama administration, they knew that they were setting themselves up for a lawsuit from the Education Department and the Justice Department's offices of civil rights for having uh, disparate discipline rates for blacks and whites. Well, you know what? Here's why there's disparate discipline rates. Black teenagers between the ages of 14 and 17 commit gun homicide at 10 times the rate of white teenagers, male teenagers between the ages of 14 and 17. So you've got a, a, an exponential 10 times difference rate of, of gun homicide. If you think that the, that the social breakdown that leads to that disparity and, and that degree of, of criminal behavior does not also play out in classroom behavior of the inability to control impulse, uh, you know, a, a, a lack of respect for authority. Of course it does. Of course it does. Inner city classrooms are often places of violence. Teachers are the most left-wing profession in the country. And yet we are supposed to believe from, you know, some of these radicals at UCLA and Harvard ed schools that they are arbitrarily imposing higher rates of discipline on black kids out of racism, which is completely absurd. But so now you have, and, and you better believe the Biden Justice Department is going to revive that sort of lens on schools. And, and so you have classrooms where, and, and the principals are terrified about suspending any, anybody because it will have a disparate impact on blacks. And so you have teachers being assaulted at great rates and, and the classrooms are again, descending further into anarchy. So nobody can learn. The kids that are there to learn uh, can't do it because the, the troublemakers are standing up and singing and got their back to the class and, and uh, you know, trying to be as disruptive as possible. Wow. It's, it's, it's crazy. It, you know, when you have a disruptor, it's kind of like that old Harvard business school study that said, uh, a negative colleague is four times as toxic as a positive colleague is beneficial <laughs> to a group environment. And I think it's kind of like that with school discipline, a, 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 a loud mouth who does not respect authority is probably 10 times as damaging to a classroom environment as, you know, a, a good person who does his work and tries to study. That's absolutely right. It's, and I think John Tierney wrote a book, The Power of No, that, but we also like tend to think about negatives. This, I guess it's not really anal analogous, but um, yeah, no, it's absolutely true. It, it gives enormous power. And you know, that's what we're sort of seeing now with all of the uh, frenzy over, over pronouns and wokeness is it's the power uh, to disrupt, the power to say no, the power to criticize people. I mean, you've got these mobs now that are tearing down our past and our, our legacy because they can. I mean, unchecked power is, is one of the greatest uh, threats to civilized society. And we're being and we're indulging them now. So just going full circle here. I, I mean, I see that and I sense the passion and gift and intellect that makes an author. But how did you finally decide that you're actually going to go into this space, knowing all of the criticism you would likely get, knowing kind of the vilification that you some that you might get? Well, it was a gradual process. I started writing because I was so mad at how I'd been betrayed by my college, undergraduate college, Yale, for. Uh, but, it, you know, I, I blame myself as well for wasting so much of my education immersed in, in this sterile deconstructive uh, field. And, and then I noticed what started happening in the 80s after I long after I'd graduated from college was the rise of multiculturalism and feminism in literature uh, that was even worse, much, much worse than deconstruction. I had aspired to be a literature professor. I could think of no greater privilege than being able to 
wallow days long in, in these extraordinarily sublime works. So I began to write out of anger at what I saw happening on the cultural front and eventually got into more reported material uh, on urban policy, which is something I'd never, ever been involved with before. So had to kind of learn on the job. So it was not as if when I started writing, I knew what lay ahead and, uh, and the degree of pushback, although that became pretty clear early on because in the 1990s, which is when I started writing, that was when Giuliani, Mayor Rudolph Giuliani was head of New York and uh, he was a revolutionary. I mean, he was, he talked about being a disruptor uh, and the, the, the hatred pushback against him from the New York Times and other institutions that had been used to holding sway in New York was enormous. So, so it was big, but the, it has gotten worse. It has gotten worse. The, uh, the name calling and the, the exercise of sheer brute power to try and silence people uh, has gotten uh, much more worrisome. And, And one doesn't know, you don't want to sound like a Cassandra but you don't know as well whether to pull the power cord and say an emergency cord and say, you know, we are headed very quickly to something that is going to be a, a complete repudiation of, of Western civilization with its, as you say, essential respect for the rule of law and, and uh, a neutral set of principles by which everybody should be governed. Well, you're delivering a, a courageous siren song, um, and my book, An Inconvenient Minority, which is out on Tuesday, The Attack on Asian American Excellence, is also a siren song, uh, because Asian Americans, when they drop, when people start attacking Asian American excellence, you know they're coming for the meritocracy. Um, so, you know, we're in this same space, we're fighting it, and I really appreciate everything that you do. Um, last question, Heather. Who is your favorite president? <laughs> well, uh, I, I, you know, I can't answer that. I'm not. Uh, I, I don't purport to be a student of American history to the extent I should be. So I, you know, I, I only have the the uh, typical names that would come to mind, and I I can't claim that I arrive at those through any kind of uh, deep knowledge. So that, that's amusing. I will say this, I will, I will tip my hand. However, I was still a liberal during Ronald Reagan's time. And so I've never like revised my reception. So I, I kind of did not perceive Reagan the way most conservatives do. And so Uh I'm not going to say Reagan, which is unusual (laughs) because, uh, I was, you know, I, I was at Stanford Law School during that period, and I remember buying a T-shirt that was put out by some left-wing student organization uh, that was Reagan Busters Don't Get Slimed Again. So I was still in my unthinking phase back then, and, and as I say, I've not had the time to go back and, and closely follow the record. But uh, so, you know, the obvious ones of, of Lincoln, uh, he, he presided over a time that we are starting to rival it for deep, deep divisions within this country, whether we end up in a hot war that he had to preside over, I don't know, but, but obviously he was a statesman that has few uh, precedents or or followers. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe I'll work you around to Reagan at some point, Okay. But, (laughs) but thank you so much, Heather, Heather McDonald, author of the war on cops, diversity delusion. Thank you so much for, Uh, being here on the Inconvenient Minority Podcast. Thank you. Well, congratulations on the book, and it'll be great to see it in print and in bookstores. I really look forward to that. Congratulations, Kenny. That's a great achievement. Oh, means a lot to me. Thank you. Hey, this is Kenny Hsu. Uh, If you guys enjoyed this podcast, you should buy my book, An Inconvenient Minority, The Attack on Asian American Excellence and the Fight for Meritocracy. It's out today everywhere. Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Walmart, IndieBound. Get it from your favorite local bookstore. Get it on Amazon today. 
Uh, really appreciate you guys investing in the podcast, but go out and buy the book because it tells about all these ideas in a much greater detail than I could ever do in a single podcast. So uh, get it today and thanks for listening.